Hello and welcome to Lion Wing Talks, a weekly show where we talk about all things Lion Wing, tabletop games, Japanese tabletop games, and localization. I'm your host, Bradley Hailstorm. I'm also the founder and president of Lion Wing, and this is episode 12, and we've got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. Lots of questions were submitted for this episode, more than in recent memory, which is awesome. A lot of really great questions. We get great questions every week, and the, the, the trend continues tonight. So I'm excited to answer these questions. A lot of these questions I have not gotten before, which is cool. Um, and we've got some updates to share. Perhaps not as many updates as I've had in some previous weeks, but I've still got stuff to talk about, which is great. Primarily as it relates to Wild Hunt Festival and Gun and Gun. A little bit of Testament news, not much on the Embryo Machine front there, but I'll go through all those project updates because we follow a format on this show. We open up with uh, the community questions in which I answer, and then we move into our project updates, and then we'll kind of close out the show. So uh, I see we've got some folks in the chat. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Uh, much appreciated. And I'm just going to jump into this because I've got a lot on the docket tonight and I want to make sure that we get through it in a timely manner. Now, I say I want to get through it in a timely manner, but if you've been watching the show, you know that timely to me is like an hour and 15 minutes. Um, sometimes we go longer than that. I think I've gone an hour and 25 or an hour and 30 minutes before. So you never know what you're going to get with these shows. I always say like, oh yeah, tonight's going to be the one where I get it under an hour. And then I end up getting it to like 55 minutes and then I ramble for another 25 minutes. So I, I don't know, maybe I should just come to grips with the fact that the show is meant to be an hour and 15 to an hour and 30 minutes long. Uh, I should maybe just stop fighting fate because I'm, I'm starting to believe that that's what this is. It's fate. I'm supposed to do this show for 90 minutes. So let's get to this. We've got questions. My first question of the evening. Are NDAs a thing in your line of work or is the honor system sufficient? Yeah, so NDAs are a thing in this line of work. They're a thing in the tabletop industry. They're a thing in, in every, <laughs> every industry, whether you're in entertainment or otherwise. Uh, NDAs are a thing. And uh, we use them at Linewing. Most of the time, I don't, I'm sure there's been like some project where I haven't used an NDA, uh, but most of the time I use an NDA. Also, sometimes an NDA will be dictated by the license holder. And depending on how large the license is that you're working with, especially if you're working with like a pre-established IP or something, then they will require you to have an NDA. So even if you are a company that kind of runs a little loose when it comes to that kind of thing. You don't have an option sometimes depending on the IP you're working with um, and that kind of thing. Uh, I hope I'm still up at this point. Uh, it looks like the stream may have just gone down. I don't know what's going on tonight. If it did go down, I'm sorry for folks who are watching live, but uh, definitely catch us on playback if that's what happened here. So, um, all right. So NDAs are mandatory, as someone just mentioned in the chat. They're mandatory pretty much everywhere if you work in the entertainment industry, for sure. And they might be mandated by who your partners are in this line of work. So, you know, we have a we have a project coming up that the company mandated an NDA for. So even if you want to get away from it, sometimes you simply can't. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean... So depending on who you work with, you could probably just get away with using the honor system. You know, a lot of people in the tabletop industry, you know, they're, they're running small teams and they're using the same folks and it's usually folks they've worked with in the past. And so, you know, it's, they feel comfortable not needing an NDA. And if you're working with people, you know, or are your friends or something to that effect, um, then it's probably not needed. I don't know. It's just, it's a big risk. I mean, you never want your stuff to get out there before you want it to get out there. And I mean, certainly I don't like that kind of thing. I like to control how much information gets out there about our projects. I think in the past, some information leaked a little early. Um, and I wasn't super happy with that, but you know, it's like, it is what it is. It happens. And then you just got to kind of roll with it. But NDAs help tighten the ship a little bit. And that's always a good thing. I think so uh, the next question, what does the timeline look like for a game between the time of first contact with the designers and the Kickstarter launch? Yeah, so it depends. It depends on a number of factors. 
some like okay so if i if i signed a contract with a designer tomorrow they would know that they were signing a contract for a release at the end of 2022 or early 2023 uh, because that's what my release schedule is like right now that i'm already booked up for the rest of this year i'm booked up for most of uh, for most of next year. And realistically I'm booked for all of next year, but you always do have a project or two that you can kind of slide in and out and slot in and out where you need to slot that project. Um, but by and large, yeah, if I signed with someone tomorrow, you know, it would be with the understanding of we're not going to get to Kickstarter for your game for the next year and a half. Um, if not more, if you know, maybe over a year and a half. Now in the beginning when Linewing didn't have many projects, didn't have many clients, um, I could sign a contract, let's say tomorrow, and then we could be on Kickstarter in five months. That's kind of what happened with Sinome. Uh, we signed that contract at the end of 2017 and then launched in June of 2018. So it was like a six, six and a half, maybe seven month turnaround for that project. It, so it all sort of depends, and it really depends on your release schedule. But it also depends on sort of the the contract terms that you negotiate. Some designers are very adamant about when their project gets released. And so some simply won't set up a deal with you if you tell them, hey, I'm not going to get to your to your project for another year and a half. And they're like, yeah, yeah thanks. No, thanks. Bye. Um, in which I understand it. I get it. You know, that's a year and a half of where they could be going with another company and getting their product out sooner and therefore making money sooner. So I really understand that kind of thing. Some designers will want it written into their contract that they want the game released within a year of the contract date. That's actually like a very common thing to see. A very, very common thing. So it, it it sort of depends on what you want to do with the project as the publisher. It sort of depends on the designer and how they envision when the project should hit and needs to hit. And it really just kind of depends on release schedules. And it also depends on the release schedules of the, the industry sort of in a larger perspective. You know, I think about... Um, the Monster Hunter World board game that just launched this, uh, this week on Kickstarter. And it's like, if you had a game lined up to launch around this time that was very similar in terms of like aesthetic or mechanics, you probably would want to push that once you knew, once you knew that Monster Hunter World was coming to Kickstarter, perhaps around the same time as your game. If you can, you probably would want to push your game back a little bit to avoid, to avoid that. Um, or you'd want to move it up and launch sooner. I mean, that kind of thing does happen. You know, the, the industry is only so large and most, a lot of companies kind of know what other companies are doing because companies talk with one another, especially if you're occupying the same space. It's not unusual for you to talk with those other companies to say, hey, um, so here's what we got lined up for our next project. What What is your next project? And if it's similar, when do you plan on releasing that? Uh, because we want to do our best to avoid, you know, overlapping one another. Uh, because if you're sharing a similar audience, you don't want to burn your audience out and you don't want to, requ- you don't want to ask too much of them, uh, by saying, Hey, you're going to back this project from this company and then you're going to back our project. And the two projects are very similar, or maybe they're not similar at all, but you still want to avoid it because you know that the, the demographic overlap is, is pretty big. And so I've done that kind of thing before I've reached out to other companies to say, Hey, uh, what do you got coming up? Because here's what I got coming up. Let's let's make sure that we don't cannibalize each other's market, you know. Um, and and most of the time, people are very cool with that because ultimately it helps them too. Uh, so it helps you. It helps them. It helps all the designers involved. Uh, so that that kind of thing I have done before, and I will continue to do. All right. Uh, next question. What are some releases from the recent game market that have got your eye? Yeah. So this past game market was interesting. It, I would probably say since I've really been like scouting game markets, I guess this is coming up on four years now. This was probably the game market that I was uh, the least interested in, in terms of what was presented, what debuted. Uh, there was some good stuff. Don't get me wrong. There was a lot, a lot of good stuff, but it was a 
a, a lot of the other stuff was not stuff that I would be interested in. It would not be stuff that I would be interested in playing personally. It would not be stuff that I'd, that I'd be interested in pursuing uh, a potential publishing deal with. It was just a lot of that. A lot of what was on offer is not stuff that aligns with what Lion Wing does. Uh, there a lot. Of, there was a lot of abstract games at this at uh, this past game market. A lot of heavy abstract games. Um, two things that I don't really like. Uh, so this year certainly, w- or um, this this past game market was not for me. And that's fine. I recognize that that's going to happen. That's that's cool. But there was still there was still plenty of stuff where I was like, oh yeah, that that's a cool game. I would I you know it's not for me. Like I would never play it. But that's cool. I'm glad that exists because I know that there are people out there who would play that kind of thing. That being said, there were games, definitely games that I liked that I that caught my eye. Um, some of which I may be keeping an eye on. You know. Um, so I made a quick little list of of some stuff. Pendulum Dolls, um, Fog Sight the the re-release of fog site gangster paradise uh Rillium, dog eight chess and then laugh sketches new game so i honestly i think i just listed like six games there i don't think there's much i don't think there was much more beyond that that was all that interesting to me not when it came to like board games card games that kind of thing so there were some tabletop games or uh, some tabletop rpgs that were shown which uh, definitely uh piqued my interest but for traditional tabletop games that was it I think the pandemic has also kind of changed things and it's, it's this past game market also just felt smaller uh, in many ways in terms of what was offered in terms of um, the types of games that were offered. And I think the pandemic probably has something to do with that. It's really slowed down people's workflow. It's gotten in the way of folks, you know, hitting target release dates and that kind of thing. So I would be curious to see what this past game market would have been like had, um, the pandemic never happened. I think it probably would have looked different, but you know, um, I'm looking forward to the next one now, of course. And, uh, and, uh, and all the stuff that will come out between now and then. So, um, yeah, someone mentioned, uh, saw talk of, uh, Mon Hunt, oh, the monster hunter world board game in the chat. Would line wing ever consider releasing IP best IP based games? Yeah. So, um, yes, Yes, Lion Wing definitely would consider IP-based games. Uh, it would have to be an IP that I felt personally connected to. I don't... Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to just, like, pump out a, a an IP-based tabletop game because it would make money. Like, that's that'll never work for me. For better or for worse, I would never be able to release a game that would make a lot of money that I personally didn't like. I just, I can't do it. I don't like, I've got to, I've got to be into a game to get behind it and to do all the work associated with what it takes to localize and publish a game. If I'm like, if I'm not 100% invested and I'm not kidding, it has to be 100%. It can't, it can't be like 98%. It has to be 100%. Uh, if I'm not 100% invested, then, um, I, I'm not going to pursue that project because I know I'm, I'm not going to do my best work. I'm not going to get behind it. I'm not going to be invested in it. I'm not going to be interested in presenting it in the best way possible. I'm not going to be interested in putting in the countless and countless and countless of hours that it takes to take a game from Japanese, get it to English, and then publish it and ship it. I'm not willing to do any of that if I'm not 100% committed to whatever that game is. So it would have to be an IP that I felt very strongly about. Um, it looks like the stream keeps jumping in and out. I don't know what's going on. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, it would, I, I definitely would consider, um, IP based stuff. It would just have to be the right IP. And, you know, there are some IPs out there that I feel very strongly about. Uh, there may be some IPs out there that I've already reached out about to certain companies. So you never know what might be coming in the future from Lion Wing as it pertains to a pre-established franchise. What, uh, next question. Was not having a retailer option in your most recent Kickstarter projects an intentional choice 
an intentional choice, I realized that only Sinome had that option. Yeah, so in my experience, um, in my experience, if, if a retailer wants your game and they don't see a retailer pledge option, they're just going to reach out to you and say, hey, uh, I want your game. What can we do? The, the thing about it is, and you've, if you've followed our campaigns, then you have noticed that I try to run a very lean campaign when it comes to what's presented and the rewards sidebar. So I try not to have more than three tiers in the reward sidebar um, because I anecdotally, I feel like uh, if you put too many tiers on that right side, people get overwhelmed. They uh, get analysis paralysis, like, oh, what should I choose? There are six tiers to choose from. I don't know which one I want. And then they just don't choose any of them. And then they don't back your game. And so perhaps you set off with the right intentions of let's give buyers options. Let's give backers options. Uh, And perhaps you gave them too many options. So I never want to overload people with choices. And I never want to overwhelm them with choices. Even if it's just sort of like the illusion that there's too many choices. Because let's say I, like for Embryo Machine, we did two tiers. But let's say I threw a retailer tier in there. That's only three tiers. But that's another thing that your eye has to keep track of. And as you're scrolling through those tiers, especially because we pack our tiers with items and descriptions and whatnot, adding in just one more tier might be just enough for someone to say, ah, it's too much stuff. I don't want to read that. I'm... um, I'll come back to it. I'm going to go finish this other thing real quick and then I'll come back and and I and I'm going to really read this thing to figure out what it is I want from this project, but I got to read all these words to figure out what I want from this project and then they never come back. So, I never want to be that person and if I can mitigate some of that, I want to do that. And one of the ways that I mitigate that typically is I get rid of the retailer tier. Knowing from experience that even when retailers do not see a tier for them, they will reach out and say, Hey, I'm a retailer. I didn't see a tier. Uh, you know, what, what, what offers do you have for retailers? And then I, you know, then I say, okay, yeah, here's, here's what I've got to offer. And that is, that's literally how it's worked in every campaign I've run since I know So I don't plan on changing that anytime soon. If there was like a certain type of game that really benefited from a retailer tier, like a tabletop RPG, I I would probably more seriously consider including that as a tier on the right side. But other than that, nah, I'm not going to do that. So next question. As president, a leadership role, how do you balance company slash business priority and employee care slash satisfaction, you know, balance of profit and people? Uh, yeah, so planning, that's how you do it. It's as simple as that, planning and, communi- and communication. So if I'm not, you know, at the beginning of a project, I try to lay out the entire project roadmap with milestones along the way. And I like to set expectations very clearly with folks in the early goings to say, hey, signing on to this project, here's what we're up against. Here are our challenges. Here are the deadlines we have to hit, and we have to hit them at these intervals. And here's the end product, and here's what the end product needs to look like, and this is when we need to present the end product. So I really try to lay out everything for folks up front so that they know what they're getting into. That way it's not one of those situations where, They get going into the project and because you haven't communicated to them what this project is really going to entail and everything that is going to come with completing that project, if if you don't do that and they get going, it's really easy for them to feel like, whoa, hold on, this is like way more than I bargained for. This is not what I thought I was signing up for. This is too much work. This is too much pressure. There are too many deadlines. There's too many milestones to hit and I can't do it. Uh, that's how you burn someone out real quickly. That's also how you burn a bridge because then that person never want to, they never want to come back and work for you uh, because it's like, I don't, I don't want to work for this person. Like they threw me into this project with, with no clear vision and no oversight and no communication. And I was left just kind of on my own to figure it out. And I don't want to do that again. So planning is how you balance planning and communication. My whole motto has been plan good, feel good, work good. Now, aside from the fact that that's grammatically incorrect, it's meaning. It's meaning is what matters. <clears throat> because if, if, if you are planning, if you plan well, 
you're going to be able to feel good along the way as you're doing your work. You're not going to get burnt out. You're not going to get overwhelmed. And when you're not burnt out and when you're not overwhelmed, you do good work. So those are kind of my three things when I think about how do I balance people versus product. And really having regular check-ins with the team, both together as a team, but also individually to say, um, hey, how are things going with you? Like, what are your pain points right now? What do you think is going really well? What are your victories right now? Because let's continue to try to figure out how to get those victories so that you can stay motivated going through this project. But also, you know, let's look at what's getting in the way or let's look at the stuff that is not energizing you that perhaps is doing just the opposite. And how do we mitigate some of those factors? Can we pass some of that work off to someone else who that stuff does energize them or that stuff does jive with their skill set when perhaps it doesn't jive with yours? And so I, I really try to, you know, take care of the worker themselves to ensure that they're feeling good throughout the project and to feel like their their concerns, but also their successes are being heard because it's just as important to hear about someone's victories as it is to hear about someone's hindrances. And so I want to give them a forum to talk about both of those things. And so regular check-ins are important uh, individually, also checking in with the larger team so that everyone in the team sort of knows what the other person is doing. It, it builds a sense of camaraderie. It builds good morale. It builds a good team culture. And when people feel like they are performing not only for themselves, but also for the next person, for the person next to them in the trenches, they tend to perform even better. And so if you build bonds between people, if you build bonds between team members, that's when a team can really kind of hit its stride and work, uh, sort of optimally and the most effectively and and the most efficiently that it can. And the only way you do that though, is you bring the team together for the team to talk amongst themselves. Sometimes it's a, it's a team meeting where I'm present. And then other times it's a team meeting where I'm not present. And that gives the team an opportunity to talk about things that they wouldn't feel comfortable talking about with me in the room. It might be just a, an opportunity and, and a forum for them to sort of commiserate, you know, and complain. Um, and perhaps they need to do that. Perhaps that, that venting is good for them. Perhaps that venting is good for building bonds, but they wouldn't maybe not do that if, if I were there. And so sometimes I'll just do team meetings when I'm not present at all. And so, you know, it's, it's a balance and, you know, being in, in a project oversight role and being in a leadership role, um, and really kind of being a manager of people, it's important that you understand what makes people tick. It's important that you understand what, what slows people down, but then also what speeds them up. And how do you make sure that you throttle them at the right time and also pull them back a little bit when you realize, hold on a second, they're running too hard. They're going to burn out too quickly doing that. Um, so it, it's, it's, creative problem solving when you're in this kind of role. Uh, and, and really you're problem solving, uh, human, human problems. I mean, at the end of the day, like, yes, Lion Wing, um, we produce games, physical products that people use and play, but the only way we're able to do that is through the people that make those things possible. And so I've always looked at like, yes, Lion Wing is a, is a game company, but for me in my leadership role, like Lion Wing is a human company. It's a person company because there are real people that are making this stuff happen. And without those people making those things happen, we don't get any games. Um, and so you got to take care of your people if you want to take care of your games. And if you want to take care of your games, if you can take care of your games, um, you know, you take care of your customer. And so it's like this domino, but it all starts with the team. You take care of them. They'll take care of the game. The game will take care of customers. Uh, that's how I look at it anyway. I'm sure different leaders have different approaches and different styles and have different philosophies and visions for how all this stuff works and how to be a manager and et cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's how I, that's how I picture it. All right. So let's see here. Lion, next question. Lion's Wing, Lion Wing's mission is to localize Japanese anime style games, but how strict are you with that? Could you see yourself localizing Japanese non-anime style games or localizing slash publishing anime style games outside of Japan in the future? Yes. So good question. This is actually a, a, a slight modification of a, of a question that we actually kind of get later in the show and that we've gotten before. And, and that question is like, would you ever publish games that are not Japanese? But this one's uh, this one's a little different. You're asking, would we publish Japanese games that are not that do not have that anime visual presentation? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are games that I like that do not, uh, from Japan that do not have an anime aesthetic. 
Uh, there are a lot of Japanese war games that I like a lot that clearly have no anime aesthetic. Is that in my immediate future right now? No, because I do like anime games. <laughs> um, and that is my focus right now, especially you know, Lion Wing is still a young company and it, I'm doing everything that I can to establish its brand and, and Lion Wing's brand is anime games. And so I want to make sure that our output, especially in the early goings, align with that vision and with that branding as much as possible. And so that means that you're going to get anime themed games for quite a while from Lion Wing before we step outside of that of that motif. I think it can and probably will happen at some point that we publish a game that does not look like some of our other games, uh, but that time's not really right now and it shouldn't be right now and it won't be right now. Uh, but you know, I, I do want to make it known that I like games that I don't just like anime themed Japanese games. I like a lot of different types of games. Now that tends to be my go-to. Um, but there are some things that I like that do not have that, that visual flair, um, that you see from our stuff. Uh, just to go back to the earlier question of like what I liked from this year's game market, I think about fog site, a fog site is, has no anime aesthetic to it whatsoever, but it's amazing. Um, amazing. It's, it's an amazing game. Um, and so that's one of those games where like, I would love to localize and publish that game. It has no anime aesthetic at all. And so I wouldn't want to do it right now. Uh, but I would love to, at some point, localize and publish Fog Sight or a game like it. And that does not use that, that visual presentation. So, um, and then the other question is, could you see yourself localizing Japanese anime? Uh, Oh, uh, yes. Uh, publishing anime style games outside of Japan in the future. Yeah, probably. I mean... A lot of people utilize that look, uh, and it's not just Japanese designers who are utilizing that look. So I would definitely consider it. That being said, I like to be authentic. You know, I like to, um, when it comes to the Japanese anime style, I like to have an authentically Japanese anime presentation, and that involves working with Japanese designers. That's just a lion wing thing. That doesn't mean like other companies can't do that. Um, but that's like, that's my thing. That's what I want to focus on. That's the, those are the the designers that I want to support and that I want to help and that I want to be under the lion wing banner for English publication. So I, I guess that's my answer to it. I would, I would be open to it, but sort of like, you know, the, the question about would I tackle non-anime Japanese games, like down the line, maybe. Uh oh! Someone says I'm, they're getting audio feedback. I don't like. I don't like the sound of that. I don't like the sound of that at all. Um, I wouldn't be surprised with how my connection's been tonight. I don't know what's going on. Um, if you're watching via the stream, I'm sorry that things have been what they are. I guess I'm not terribly surprised. My internet connection has been a little funky for like a week now. Uh, we got through Lion Wing plays a couple nights ago without any hiccups, which honestly was surprising to me. I expected at least a couple DCs, but. Um, Tonight, yeah, it seems like we're just uh, riddled with, with issues. So, okay, next question. What inspired you to learn Japanese? Any tips on learning um, different languages? Yeah, so what inspired me to learn Japanese was actually a Sega Saturn game. Um, I don't think I've ever told anyone this story, not in a, not in a public way like this. Um, so there was a import Sega Saturn game, uh, published by Sega themselves called Wackenroder, um, although it's spelled like Wackenroder. Uh, it was a, a dark steampunk fantasy strategy RPG in the vein of uh, Tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics, to a lesser extent, Fire Emblem. Um, and I was really smitten with this game. So like I consider the, the Sega Saturn sort of like when I really hit my peak of finding out I loved video games and the gaming medium. And so because the, the Saturn was sort of my conduit into, uh, into gaming as a bit of a lifestyle, I have a certain fondness for a lot of the games that, um, 
were on the Saturn. And the Saturn is one of those consoles where there haven't been a lot of like remakes or remasters of the games that were offered on that system. And so, which is both like a total bummer because there were so many good games on the Saturn and also kind of interesting that like there is this whole like console out there that hasn't been touched by the remaster craze, which makes like collecting of the collecting of those games. And I do collect Saturn games, you know, all the more fascinating and all the more fun. But yeah, so there was this game called Vakken Rotor. It was an SRPG. And um, I, it was at my local electronics boutique. This is when uh, Electronics Boutique, well, was still called Electronics Boutique and not EB Games, but they were going through this phase where they were experimenting with selling uh, Japanese imports, and they really only did it for the Saturn and a little bit of the PlayStation 1. Uh, so there were a ton of like Sega Saturn games that I found that were Japanese exclusives by just going to my local EB and looking at their import shelves, you know, um, Games like Fire Pro Wrestling, that was the first time I experienced Fire Pro Wrestling, was picking up an import copy from my local EB for Saturn. Uh, and then uh, things like Deep Fear, which is uh, one of my all-time favorite survival horror games. And then there's Vakken Rotor. And so I, I bought it knowing that I was not going to be able to... I had no... I mean, I was like, I don't know, 12 years old at the time, maybe 11, and uh, knew like, I don't... I'm not going to be able to do anything with this game. I'm just going to fumble my, fumble my way through all the menus. Like, this is a text-heavy game. Um, I guess I would have been, like, 13, actually. But still. Um, so I, I took it home. I played it. I fell in love with it. Couldn't read a damn thing. Stumbled through the menus. It took me hours to figure out, like, what you know, what each command did. But I kind of made a, a cheat sheet for myself, just writing it down in my composition book. Um, it was my math composition book. I just like grabbed it from my back, my backpack, started writing on it. Um, uh, and so that was the game where, you know, I was playing and I was like, I, I, I want to know what I'm doing here. I want to know this language. I want to learn this language. Now it would, it would take me another like, uh, six years to finally learn the language. Cause I didn't start learning Japanese until I got to college. Uh, but that was, that was the catalyst for learning the language. And, any advice for folks who are learning a new language? Uh, yeah, a couple things. Practice it every day. Uh, for me, I learned a lot of Japanese by watching anime um, with no English options at all. Uh, no English subs, obviously no dubs. And learning it through, uh, through just watching and finding patterns in... Uh, in the dialogue and picking up, okay, so I've heard that before. I've heard that before. I heard it in these contexts. Um, I saw it with these facial expressions. I heard it with, with this type of tone. Um, I, I, I saw it in this kind of situation. Okay. I think I'm kind of understanding what that phrase means. Um, and so I always found that to be very helpful, especially when I was learning it in college, I would do that a lot. Um, because then at least I had a context for, you know, for, for some of the, for some of the language, for some of the words, um, for some of the vocabulary. Uh, so I wasn't just pulling from nothing. So that's what I would say. I would say, you know, practice it a little bit every day. Find yourself an, your, find yourself an app. There are so many really good apps out right now. So I've, throughout the years, people are like, would you, would you suggest Rosetta Stone or something? You know, I'm like, no, no, I would not suggest Rosetta Stone. I mean, no offense to anyone who wants to do that or has done that and has found success with it. Awesome. Good for you. I'm glad, glad to hear it. I'm sure it works for plenty of people. It never worked for me. Um, I also needed the classroom environment. I realized that because before I got to college, I had tried to learn Japanese on my own in high school and like, I just didn't have the discipline for it, but being in a classroom and having to sort of report to someone and having tests and know that I was going to be graded kind of sp sparked motivation and made that internal intrinsic motivation to get things done. Uh, whereas I probably didn't have that when I was just doing it on my own. So, Hey Frank. Uh, I would also say, so <clears throat> Vak and Rotor was a big thing. And then, uh, you know, I ended up, I was a huge dreamcast person, which I think I mentioned like on episode one or something. There was a Capcom develop and a Capcom developed and published RPG series called El Dorado Gate that I so desperately wanted to play. This vibrant, colorful, 2D, old school JRPG for um, 
you know, one of my favorite systems of all time, if not my favorite system, depending on the day, I'll tell you my favorite console is the Dreamcast or the Saturn, but still, um, and I love Capcom and I love that era of Capcom. And so, um, they came out with El Dorado Gate and it was another one of those moments where I was like, oh, shit, I want to know what this is. I want to, I want to be able to play this. So really what inspired me to learn Japanese were video games. Uh, next question here. It's the last question. Have you ever considered taking line wing publishing to developing in the future as a publisher? Do you ever have dreams of making your own product from the ground up? Yeah. So a little bit, uh, I've mentioned on some of the previous episodes, I think this is before you found us, Joey, that, uh, I, before I started line wing, I was developing my own game and, uh, that was back in 2016 or so, uh, kind of this JRPG party based PVP game. And then ultimately decided I wanted to really just focus on localization for the time being. But throughout the years, I've continued to refine that game. And that game is actually done. It's finished. The art's finished. The rules are finished. It's been play tested hell and back. I still play it um, just to kind of keep fresh on it. And to, you, can never, you can never not play test a game enough. Uh, so there is something that's waiting in the wings that has been developed from the ground up that I designed that I would love to do something with. But I'm just waiting for the right time. And the, the, that time is not right now. So there is a precedent for having an interest in building stuff from the ground up. And I would like to do that in the future. Um, I would like to build out a team and, you know, put together some of our own products. It's not my immediate priority. I really like localization. I really, really, really feel passionately about localization. And as I've said before, like I localize people's works who are real geniuses, real experts at their craft. And I'm not that person. So, um, so it's, it's more fun for me to see someone else's brilliance on display in game form than try to do it myself, but building out a team of people who are brilliant at that kind of thing is interesting. Uh, if I, if I'm being honest, I would probably say outside of the game that I designed myself, if we ever wanted to kind of build something from the ground up, it probably would not be a board game or a card game. It would probably be a tabletop RPG just because that's where my interest lies when it comes to creating uh, from the ground up. So um, yeah, I think that's how that would go. Okay, so that is, those are our questions. Lots of questions tonight. Thank you all so much for submitting those questions. I love when we've got uh, listener questions. It's the reason why I started this show. I wanted to better connect with you all, the community. And one of the ways um, to do that was to have this live forum and this fast line to me where you can ask me anything and you're guaranteed to get an answer. So thank you for taking the opportunity to send me these questions, very thoughtful questions, very good questions. And I hope to get some more from y'all in the future. So let's talk about some project updates now. Um, Testament. So um, the street date on Testament is May 12th. That's the street date. So does that mean you will get your copy of Testament on the 12th? Some of you will. Does that mean you will get your copy of Testament before the 12th? Some of you probably will. And does that mean you will get Testament sometime after the 12th? Some of you probably will. But May 12th is the official uh, street date per Japanime Games. We've never been closer to having Testament in our hands than we are right now. And that's, that's the truth. So I'm looking at my calendar down here. The wait is coming to an end. I know I've said that many times, but really the wait is coming to an end. When you've got a, when you've got a street date and it's being announced by Japanime themselves, yeah, the end is in sight for, for waiting for Testament. So that's my Testament update. Uh, Wild Hunt Festival update. Yeah, so here we go. Uh, I've been waiting on confirmation about what happened with our damn games. Did they get, did the pallets get picked up? Did they not? Did they get put on the ship? Did they not? Has the ship left port or has it not? I finally have an answer. So the pallets did get picked up. They did get put on the, the container ship. They did not get picked up and put on the container ship when... I had originally gotten word that they had. 
So I had gotten word that they had been picked up and put on the container ship the day before Easter. And in actuality, they that didn't happen for another 10 days, which puts us like into last week, the end of the week before that, uh, which means the, the ship has not left uh, port in China yet, but they're there and they're waiting. Uh, and so that's great news. To, to, I got confirmation on that this morning, actually, at about 6 a.m. Um, so my guess is that container ship makes U.S. port the third week of May. That'd be my guess, the third week of May. Assuming that it doesn't like leave um, port in China tomorrow or something. My guess is it won't leave until Monday or Tuesday, which puts us at the 26th, 27th. Sorry, I'm looking at my calendar here. And it's going to take two to three weeks. It'll take probably 16 to 18 days to get to port. But U.S. ports have been really, really bogged down the past month, like big time. Uh, I mean, they were bogged down at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And then they got the congestion kind of like lifted, it cleared up. And then just in the past, like four weeks or so, uh, they've gotten more congested again. And so that may slow things down by a week. So like, let's say they make U S port on the 10th or the 11th of May, it's going to take an extra five days to get through customs there. Whereas normally it would take a couple, then it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be put uh, on a carrier, probably on a train, uh, across country because our fulfillment center is in Indiana, which puts us uh, like the 24th or so of May. It'll be it'll be uh, counted and inventoried by Fun Again for the first two days that it's there, and then um, shipping out to backers will will happen shortly thereafter. These are all rough timelines. Don't hold me to any of this stuff. As you've seen, uh, pandemic or not, these things do not always go according to plan. They do not always go according to the timelines that you as the publisher create in your head, and they do not go according to the timelines that the experts who are handling every these things every step of the way project that they are going to hit. And so uh, you would think that, oh, you know, this is what these companies do. They, they specialize in freight. They they are accustomed to timelines and they can, they should because of that be able to really nail down an exact timeline. And the, I mean, the reality is no, they can't, they can't do that. And even when they try, they too can be wrong uh, because there are just so many variables that can, that can get in the way of something going exactly as planned, even by the people who do this for a living, things don't always go according to their plan. So uh, what I'm telling you here is all just rough estimates. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I will say that May looks pretty safe for when the uh, when the sh when the container ship will make port, which is good. Are late backers going to get it around then as well? Yeah. So as long as you put your order in, let's see here. As long as you put your order in by the end of this month, by April, if you're a late pledger, your stuff will go out at the same time as everyone else. Now, if you put your late pledge in in like the second week of May, no, you're going to be waiting for a while. Uh, so if you know anyone who wants to late pledge or they saw the campaign while I was live, I was like, ah, no, I'll catch that on the back end of things. Now's the time to tell them to go finalize that order. Uh, if not, they're going to be waiting until, until June or July. Um, so that is our Karadia update. Gun and gun. Yeah. So we're, we're, uh, we're waiting on the next round of production proofs from, uh, from the printer. I feel confident about these proofs. You know, I told you the last time, before we got our first round of proofs that I didn't feel confident about certain things, the storage box and the like. And I was right, you know, those things came back and they needed modifications. That was fine. That was expected. Um, I'm excited to see the changes we asked for. Uh, we also asked for a few, a few changes um, that I have not said anything about. And I'm not going to say anything about until like the games just show up because I do want there to be an element of surprise. And so you will see things in the final, in the final product that you have not seen yet. Uh, the way that you know some of the final, 
some of the product right now will not be the way that you know it once you get the final copies in hand. And that's a good thing. There are some, there are some cool changes that we made, uh, some, some subtle tweaks that I think will go a long way in making an impression. So I'm excited about that. Uh, Silent Frank in the chat, you said, yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm assuming you meant you late pledged at the end of March. So yeah, you're fine. Uh, some other gun and gun news. We are introducing, if you missed Lion Wing plays on Monday, then you missed this bit of news because I shared this on Monday. If you're not watching Lion Wing plays, I do break some news there on that show as well. So if you're looking to always stay up to date, check out that show. It's only an hour. It doesn't go in an hour. It doesn't go an hour and a half typically. Uh, s still, uh, I mentioned this on Monday, so I'll mention it here. We are introducing the fourth and final course at Gunner uh, to Tabletop Simulator next week. That also means we're going to be introducing the sixth and final core set gun, which is the shotgun uh, called Kasane. So you will have the complete core set of Gun and Gun on Tabletop Simulator next week. Now we're doing that for a very specific reason, and that is because next week we will also be revealing uh, the details on the first tournament. So details today were finalized for that first tournament thanks to Beans and Sin Theory. Um, our community leads, they really took the reins to sort out what this first tournament was going to look like and uh, did it amongst themselves, presented it to me to say, here's what we came up with. All we need for you to do is to come up with uh, the prizes. And so they really did all the hard work there. I just said, all right, cool, we'll do this for the prizes. And they even had some input on that as well. I think the prizes are going to be pretty cool. Uh, they're not going to be the prizes for the, for this first tournament, you know, this is just a one-off tournament. Uh, so the prizes for this first tournament are not going to be indicative of, of the types of prizes that you'll get for the Virtual League. We are saving some really cool stuff for the Virtual League. I think the prizes for the tournament are also really cool, but the Virtual League is where you're going to get some really rad prizes. Um, so stay tuned for that. We won't be talking about the Virtual League for a while still. But tournament details, the first tournament uh, details, will be dropping next week. I will probably drop those details. I haven't decided if I'm going to drop those details on Lion Wing Plays or Lion Wing Talks of next week. It'll be on one of those two shows. So stay tuned. I'll mention that in the uh, in the Discord once I've made a decision on that. And then once I've shared that, once I've shared that news in one of those forums, I will then post it to uh, the Kickstarter because, you know, a lot of the backers, uh, dare I say most of the backers of Gun and Guns campaign are not here in the Discord. And so it'll be cool for them to hear uh, those details. And hopefully that encourages them to join the Discord, but more importantly, to engage in the tournament. So I will say that everyone who participates in the tournament will be getting something. So, you know, it's, it's encouraged and suggested if you want to get something cool, take part in the tournament. Um, even if you're not super comfortable with the game or you don't feel like you've got what it takes or you're not the, the, the style of player who gets into the like competitive side of things, you know, this still, still like join us. It'll be fun. This, this first tournament, I was telling someone earlier today, like this first tournament is just for fun. It's nothing serious. It's, it's casual play that's organized around a, a, a tournament type format and everyone gets something for jumping in. And then the folks who, you know, earn the top spots, we'll get a little something extra. And maybe you could be one of those folks who earns one of those top spots. Or maybe not, but you still get something cool just for participating. So stay tuned for those details. I hope to see everyone there. That's Gun and Gun. Embryo Machine. No real news here other than we are waiting on the art from the uh, stretch goal map still. Uh, we should have that or I'm hoping sometime soon. That's kind of like the last piece that we're waiting on. And then uh, we've got a tabletop simulator update coming soon where we're going to introduce two uh, new Embraer machines. You know, right now we've just got two on the tabletop simulator version. And honestly, the tabletop simulator version needs a little TLC. Uh, there are some things that are a little broken about the tabletop simulator version. So we're going to go back and kind of clean those things up in addition to introducing these two new uh, these two new machines to the mix, uh, which means you also get some new decks, which will be cool. Uh, Y'all are going to vote on what those two Embryo machines are that we add to the tabletop simulator version. I'm not going to choose. Uh, so I want to leave it up to the community on what they want to see. So I'm going to be running a, uh, a poll that I will be posting through the Embryo machine Kickstarter. I'll be posting an update on... 
um, on that mm, probably not next week because I'll be too focused on gun and gun stuff. But the week after that is when you can expect a uh, an update to come along with a survey of the two uh, EMs that you'd like to see featured in the tabletop simulator version. Because uh, we are going to do more with Embryo Machine and Tabletop Simulator than we are right now, but the truth is, you know, we're still we're still tightening up and cleaning up and and um, developing Embryo Machine, and so it's not fully prepared. You know, it's not ready for prime time like Gun and Gun is, and so it's it's taking a backseat to Gun and Gun, and because you know Gun and Gun's coming out soon, and so uh, I, I want to make sure that I'm kind of hyping that up and keeping that front and center in people's minds because people are excited to get their copies of the game and i want to make sure that we main we maintain that and ride that that momentum while people are stoked about the game but in the future we definitely will be doing more with embryo machine and you'll be able to see us do more with embryo machine on lion wing plays our first three episodes of lion wing lion wing plays have been focused on gun and gun and probably the next three episodes will be focused on gun and gun i don't know uh, but we will be working in more games um uh, testament wad hunt festival embryo machines sinome uh a lot of people have not played sinome you know we, the company's come a long way since the sinome days and we've gotten a lot more backers and a lot more people supporting us than we ever did with our 281 backers from sinome coliseum ours kickstarter campaign uh so a lot of people don't know about that game and i want to introduce it through tabletop simulator uh and i have plans to do that so there's a bit of news right there, but I don't know when that's going to happen. And I've got to run some stuff by the designers to ensure that they're cool with everything. But we're putting more stuff on Tabletop Simulator uh, that are Lion Wing products. We won't be putting Testament and Wild Hunt Festival on uh, Tabletop Simulator. Not right now, especially not with Wild Hunt Festival because there's some stuff happening behind the scenes to um, that it would get in the way of us putting up that game on tabletop simulator but you'll still see those games played because uh the the games do have the ability to be played um solo or just around the table with a couple people if, if you're kind of feel if you're feeling comfortable enough uh doing that in the company of other people right now and so that's a pretty easy thing to stream so you don't really need tabletop simulator ver uh, a tabletop simulator version of those games in the same way that you do some of these other games and so just because they won't be on Tabletop Simulator doesn't mean you won't see those things show up in some of our Lion Wing plays. So those are our updates for tonight. Uh, let me look at the chat here. Joey says uh, he'll be joining in on the tourney. Thank you, Joey. I, uh, I suspected you would. I was hoping you would. So thank you for that. Uh, Silent Frank in the chat says, is there going to be a Testament plays when it's out? Yeah, so... Um, Yes, but probably just with a camera over top of Testament and me playing it. Um, that's probably how that'll go. There are too many. There are too many players in Testament. Uh, hold on, let me rephrase that because that's going to get confusing. There are too many companies involved with Testament to put that game on Tabletop Simulator, um, and so it won't show up on Tabletop Simulator. But like I said, we're still going to feature it in Lion Wing Plays. It'll just be you know, utilizing the actual real components and a different camera setup. I don't know if people have looked at our YouTube, but uh, myself and uh, our lead play test guy, Ben, we streamed some Sinome Coliseum like a year and a half ago using, you know, the actual game and had a multi-camera um, setup happening. And it turned out super well. And so I've got the camera, I've got the lighting, um, I've got the table and the space to do all of that. And I will be doing that for Wild Hunt Festival and Testament. I don't have a timeline on when I'll be doing that, but I will be doing that at some point. Okay, so that takes us to the end of tonight's show, which means that I think, I'm going to try to look at the run time here, I think that puts us right around an hour. Oh my gosh, one hour and eight seconds and counting. That's amazing. Someone in the chat said, I should work out a stream setup for uh, the Gunning on Live tournament in the next few weeks. Yes, you should. That would be cool. Oh, uh, I did want to mention about Gun and Gun. So we have someone in the chat who was with us on Monday, but he's also been uh, pretty engaged in the Gun and Gun channel uh, on our Discord. His name is Af. He has been 
super interested in diving into the stats side of gun and gun and the theory crafting side of gun and gun so if you are looking to get hype about gun and gun uh if you are looking to get more invested or to learn more about the game or to just theory craft reach out to af in the discord um we're going to be posting a video actually of him doing some theory crafting uh, he may have recorded that video earlier today or he's going to do it tomorrow i need to catch up with him i haven't talked to him since early afternoon still uh we're going to be posting that video of him doing some theory talk, uh, some theory craft talk, because I think there are people out there who want to hear that kind of thing. Af is super passionate about it. He he's been super, uh, super engaged and super excited. And uh, he played, he played against Real Beans, uh, one of our community leads, on Monday and won in an exciting fashion. And so, I'm hoping that he will continue to do that. I think he's going to be keeping some stats on the virtual league once that pops off. So he's quickly sort of becoming an, an unofficial member of the gun and gun team in some ways. If you're looking to engage in that kind of conversation, hit him up in the discord, especially since we're getting closer and we're talking more about gun and gun and the tournaments coming up, the virtual leagues coming up. I know that more people are going to kind of jump in and want to be involved in that kind of way. And he's a good person to reach out to. Okay. So, if y'all don't have any other questions for me in the chat, I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds here to get in any last questions. Then that is going to do it for this week. So we do this every week. We do it every Wednesday, 9 p.m. EST via Twitch. I throw it up um, the next day on on YouTube. I usually upload it every night because it takes like eight hours to upload because for whatever reason I uh, shoot in high resolution. But um, so if, if you miss, if you can't join us on Twitch, you can always catch us on YouTube. Uh, we're getting more subs. Uh, every time we upload an episode of Line Wing Plays or Line Wing Talks, we get a couple of new subs. So I appreciate folks, uh, you know, um, uh, subscribing to our channel. That's really awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, we pump out content twice a week now. Uh, there might be content three times a week in, in the near-ish future. And it's really important for for me to be engaged in that kind of way to create content and to show off our stuff and to uh, involve the community in the playing of our games. I think it's really fun. I really like that side of things. And I'm glad that you all join me on that, on that ride. And in some cases, for some of you, you partake in that ride yourselves. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and I've got a, one more question here in the chat from silent Frank saying, so will you be playing Testament solo or would you consider having a team? Yeah. Um, it depends on when I decide to stream Testament. If I stream Testament like right away, I'll probably just do that solo. But if I stream Testament like in the next couple months, you might find me with with my group or um, with our QA team. Some of the QA team, I mean, everyone takes the has taken the pandemic pretty seriously. Uh, Everyone on that team has a family, has kids, young kids, myself included. And so we've been very careful about how we engage with one another and have been pretty cautious about engaging in person with one another. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated now and um, I, I know some of the other folks on the team are. And so there's less worry about that kind of thing right now. So you might see us, you might see us run Testament together as a team. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to go. It'll sort of depend on the timeline. And, and I haven't decided when I'm going to stream Testament either, which is why I can't give you a good answer right now. But it will be, it, it'll be happening at some point. I know that. Uh, I haven't played Testament in quite a while now. So I've mentioned before that the games where I'm heavily involved in like their development and their localization by the time that like we finish with the campaign and we finish prepping the files for the printer, I want to get as far away from that game as I possibly can. Uh, some serious like localization fatigue and burnout sets in Testament was a long development process. Cause it's a huge game. Uh, we were in that, we were in the, the localization process for Testament for, I mean, 
close to a year. It was a long time to make sure we got that game right. And so, and that was before we even went to Kickstarter. And then you, you do all this extra stuff for the Kickstarter. I mean, we created a whole new mode for the, for the Kickstarter. We're insane. And that required play testing. And then the file prep never goes smoothly. There's always things you got to tweak and get back into those assets and resize things or whatever. It's a whole thing. And so from start to finish, Testament was like a year and a half project. And I was heavily involved in it on multiple fronts from, from creative direction to editing, to proofing, to asset development, to play testing, to project oversight, to creating additional content for the Kickstarter, being the liaison between the Japanese team, my team, Japanime, having team meetings with my team, having team meetings with Japanime, having team meetings with Manifest Destiny and Kuro and Simon at Japan Brand. I mean, I was in the trenches on that game for a long time. So when we finally sent off all the files um, last year, I said, I'm not touching Testament for a long time. I, I don't want to hear the name Testament. I don't want to see Testament. I don't want it to be near me. Uh, I just want to be away from that game for a while. Now, enough time has gone by where I'm, I'm warming up to the idea of playing it. I, I, I like talking about Testament. I like getting into the lore. I did a whole episode of one of these on on the lore of Testament. So I really like that element of Testament, but in terms of like getting back in the trenches and playing that game right now, I'm getting to the point where I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I think I'm getting ready to do that. I'm still not totally there. So, you know, if, if, if folks start getting their copies of Testament, like tomorrow, uh, and I get my copies from Japan and like tomorrow, I'm not, playing testament tomorrow it's going to take me a little bit of time which is also why i'm a little hesitant to commit to when i'm going to stream testament because i definitely have to get myself back in the headspace of playing that game and also not wanting to uh throw up just by looking at that game which is i think where i got to at some point uh when i was working on that game uh, yeah and so i mean this is the beauty of having sin and beans on the team i mean i can't i can't talk up these two guys enough because they are just amazing i mean talking about it right now is getting me a little glassy eyed that's i mean that's how cool they've been that's how helpful they've been that's how willing they've been to help out um and to do things that like they did not need to do and they've been willing to do and so uh this is why it's awesome having them on the team because sin jumps in right here on the stream and says i could always stream some plays of it and it's like oh I love you, Sin. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you'll see some streams of Testament for sure. That's that's the moral of this story. It may not be for me because I may be retching as I as I pull off the plastic of that box. I may be heaving like, oh, it's Testament again. Um, but we'll make sure that we're diving into some Testament coverage. And I'll just probably just have to get over my <laughs> my Testament fatigue. Again, like I said, I could talk about that game's lore all day long. I just played it so much. So much. So much. Okay. So I think that takes us to the end today. Thank you all who joined us. Thanks for sitting through the technical difficulties. If you're watching this via Twitch. I don't know what's going on tonight, uh, but clearly uh, the connection gods were not smiling upon me tonight. But we made it. We made it. So thanks for sticking with me. And uh, we'll do it again next week. Looking forward to it. See you next Wednesday, 9 p.m. EST. Or join us on Monday for Lion Place, 9 p.m. EST on Twitch as well.